Did you know that Washington County currently has less than two weeks of all available inventory? To be exact, that number is around 15 days. And realtors that are representing pension retirement funds are set out to purchase 20 to 30 homes per month. So if you're thinking about buying, selling, or investing in real estate right here in St. George, Utah, this video is for you. We'll get into all of the information and discuss potential housing bubble right after this intro. Folks, welcome back to our YouTube channel. Here we talk about buying, selling, and investing in real estate right here in Southern Utah, as well as all things Southern Utah, like living, working, and playing here. So if you're new around here, make sure to hit that subscribe button and the notification bell right next to it. And the only thing that we enjoy more than your love and support in the form of likes and comments is your business and your referrals. Michonne and I are both licensed realtors, and if you're thinking about any of the above, like buying, selling, or investing in real estate right here in St. George, reach out to either Michonne or myself, and we would absolutely love to take care of you and your referrals, of course. So without further ado, let's just dive right into this video. We're seeing absolute storm of information that's hitting the media, that's hitting the internet, and so many people are panicking about the housing bubble. So many people are talking about the affordability index, and quite frankly, on top of that, the things that we're seeing out in our market are pretty remarkable because this is not anything that anyone has seen since 2008. Naturally, this period in real estate, this period in the US economy is often being compared to the 2008. And there are a lot of economists and a lot of financial analysts that are pointing at things like financial crisis or potential real estate bubble. So let's address a couple of things that would first pertain to uh, the national level of things and you know the, the financial bubble and all the things the way they look from the national perspective. So our housing costs here in Washington County and from a national perspective. So from a national perspective, the housing prices had increased by nearly 16% from the very beginning of this pandemic. Um, so housing prices are up by 16%, but wages had only grew by about 3%. And there is an affordability index, which has a direct correlation between increase in wages and increase in cost of real estate. And if those two curves don't match, which they're starting to get more and more out of whack, fewer people are able to afford real estate, which eventually should lead to some form of a market correction or softening of the prices. However, currently, uh, there are a lot of other influences that cause for the housing market to continue to stay strong. Um, we have seen historically low inventory starting from uh, March of 2020, actually starting from March of 2019, um, you know, we, we went from nearly four months of supply in March of 2019, and this March we were down to just 0.66 months of supply of all available inventory. The combination of low inventory uh, along with increased demand because of historically low interest rates, like we're at all time low interest rates still, even though uh, Fed had increased the interest rate by about half a percent, this is still all time lowest. Uh, for this period of time. So the combination of a lot of folks that are ready and able to purchase uh, along with low inventory makes things a lot more challenging. And as Michonne mentioned earlier in, in this video, in the intro, in our current market here in Washington County, we're starting to see a lot more pension funds and hedge investors that are turning their portfolios from liquid cash into real estate. So what was the average number of houses that we've been seeing on the market yeah on the market like total number of inventory well from like a 30 mile radius of um saint george hurricane we're seeing a little below 200. so picture this if you have a total number of about 200 listings now when we say 200 listings that's every single family dwelling starting from the most affordable and ending with the most expensive so if that number is less than 200 and you have just a couple of investors that are on a mission to purchase 
20 to 30 homes, it doesn't take very long before your average buyer, even your average cash buyer, uh, begins to get placed out of that market because a hedge fund or a pension fund is operating in multi-millions or sometimes even billions compared to a private investor or private buyer that just has a, a relatively capped market. So that is creating a whole another issue of its own. However, we don't feel that this is the, the, the only, the major issue that's creating uh, this market and the supply issues that we're seeing. So since a lot of financial analysts are comparing what's currently happening with our market to 2008, we need to address some of the things that are very, very different from financial meltdown of 2008 and the things that created this. So this creates a lot of reluctancy for a lot of buyers and even sellers that they're starting to look back and they feel like this is something that we had already experienced. But the, the prices, the rising prices of this market had far surpassed what we have seen in 2008. And there's a couple of things that are completely new, a couple of things that we have never dealt with before. So one of them is the forbearance. Back in the very beginning of the pandemic in March of 2020, um, the government proposed a forbearance plan, which allowed for anybody that had a government backed mortgage to stop making payments without um, accruing any additional interest or suffering any penalties, which allowed for somewhere near 2.6 million people to apply for that program. And what we don't know at this point is how many of those folks actually needed to apply for that program because of financial distress as no proof was needed. So if we compare these numbers between 2008 and 2020, the outcome could potentially be devastating because in 2008, there were nearly 3 million Americans that um, fell into a foreclosure situation that were served a foreclosure notice. And it took just 860,000 Americans that actually went into a foreclosure that as a result melted down the housing market and we saw a total collapse. So currently, we're 2.6 million Americans that are applying for forbearance. Now this is a little bit different because um, the, the lending situation that created it is totally different. In 2008, a lot of mortgages were structured with adjustable rate and people were able to enjoy their low payments for three, sometimes up to five years. Also, there was very little income verification and in some cases, no income verification. So people were able to get stated income loans on the properties that they couldn't possibly afford. So that moved a lot of people into a foreclosure scenario and they, they simply couldn't afford their mortgages. In 2020, anybody that purchased a home in the last, I don't know, five to 10 years, um, income verification is very strict. All of the mortgages, to most of the mortgages, do not have um, adjustable interest rates. And most people that are in their properties have a decent amount of equity and are hopefully able to afford their homes. So when forbearance first rolled out, it allowed for folks to not worry about their mortgage payments for about 18 months. So if we think about it, 18 months will put you at about September, October of 2021, depending on when you applied for that forbearance. And we go as far as, you know, some of the financial uh, advisors are advising for people to put their primary residence into forbearance and save that 15 to $2,000, whatever their mortgage may be, uh, put that into an investment, maybe stick it in the stock market or purchase an investment property and apply that towards doing something else with that money. Well, especially because they're not getting interest or fees. So yeah. they're like, why not take advantage of it? Yeah. So essentially it opens up a portion of their income and a lot of folks haven't even been really financially impacted. There's no, there's no proof that is necessary for financial distress in order for somebody to qualify. However, Nonetheless, September, October of 2021 could still be a scary time based on, on this prediction that this is when it's supposed to end. Because we don't know what percentage of that 2.6 million 
is act- has actually been affected or what percentage are just taking advantage of that? Well, and, and typically out of that percentage too, there's, there's different things that people could do with that money. Some people could use that money to generate more income while others could take that money and go on vacation or go shopping, which short term stimulates the economy and it helps put money back into circulation, but long term puts those folks in a worse position. So just recently, CFPB, Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, uh, rolled out a proposed plan. Now, this is something that hasn't been approved yet, but should greatly affect the situation, potentially help a lot of folks, but also it may create an interesting dynamic with what we'll see going forward with um, a real estate market from a national perspective. So CFPB uh, proposed three different things that will go into effect if this bill is approved. One of those things is give borrowers more time. They proposed that no foreclosures should be um, issued until early 2022. So it gives uh, people another year prior to any financial institution being able to uh, roll out a foreclosure process. Now, another thing that's important to notice about this proposed plan is the forbearance, the original forbearance program was only available to um, government-backed mortgages, meaning the primary market, anything that's your conventional lending or um, FHA, VA loans, things like that. Now, CFPB rolls out potentially rolls out this program to anybody that even has uh, a private funding or a private lender. The second thing that's important is more options. They give borrowers more options to extend their mortgages and in some cases up to a 40 year mortgage. So essentially they keep your interest rate the same. They don't add any additional fees and your mortgage now turns from a conventional 30 year mortgage into a 40 year mortgage. With the median price of a home in Washington County right now at around 450,000, you could do the math using various mortgage calculators. I'm not gonna extend this video any longer than it needs to be, but we did the math and it could mean savings on a monthly basis, savings of anywhere from 200 to about $1,000 on, on an average mortgage. So your monthly payment could decrease by as much as $1,000 but now you have a mortgage that you'll probably never pay off in your lifetime because it'll take you 40 years. And this only applies to primary residents only. It doesn't apply to investments. And the third important thing about this new uh, guideline that is being proposed and it has been yet approved is that banks will have to keep consumers up to date. So the banks may be reaching out to everybody that may or may not be in a financial struggle and they would see if any of their um, borrowers are perhaps in a financial distress and they have to present all the borrowers with options. A lot of people were taking advantage of forbearance programs which prevented them from losing their homes so we didn't see any of the foreclosure inventory hit the market which is essentially also affecting the all available inventory. Uh, we're seeing a lot of people that are no longer feeling secure about their liquid assets. Like they don't like to keep cash in a bank. Stock market could be shaky. And that is driving a whole new wave of uh, pension funds, private investors and large investors transferring some of, their, um, some of their wealth from a form of liquid assets into real estate. They're purchasing land and they're purchasing homes. This has been a nationwide phenomenon. It has always happened about 5% of all purchases are non-owner occupied, meaning about 5% on a national level are historically um, investor purchases, you know, homes that will never get occupied by uh, an owner. A lot of the media channels are turning this into almost a bigger deal than it really is. We haven't seen the actual numbers yet, so we don't know exactly what it will transfer into. But Michonne and I had both ran into that in our market that we're, we're starting to see that it is real, it is happening. So there's a couple of things that will potentially affect the future of our market. We're, we're starting to see, let's just say, let's just assume that the CFPB plan works out and it gets approved. And now we have folks that have a 40 year mortgage, that, that restructured mortgage 
could allow for them to do a couple of things. As we're starting to see more and more um, increase in um, people's equity in their homes, they could take advantage of that equity in one of the three ways, really. They could sell their property, cash out that equity and use it somewhere else. They could refinance it, cash out and use that money and keep the home, or they could borrow it as a second mortgage. Depending on what people do with that money could determine the fate of their home. Uh, but in any event, if, if people are manipulating that debt, it would most likely mean that they're gonna be less likely to sell and move out or move up to a new home. So more equity means that people are holding on to their houses, or if they're not careful with their money and they spend that equity on something that they perhaps shouldn't have in a long term for their financial plan, that could mean that they simply cannot afford to move out of their house because now if there is any long term corrections to the market, they may not own a home that's worth what it's currently worth. In other words, they're upside down. So based on everything that we're currently seeing with rising national debt, rising cost of living and rising cost of housing, this is creating quite the storm for the inventory to remain relatively low and the demand to relay, remain relatively high. So short term, in the next 12 months, we anticipate that the inventory will stay as low, if not get any lower, um, as we're not seeing a ton of supply come in on the market from the builders because the cost of land is increasing progressively cost of lumber and trusses is up nearly 300% at this point. Uh, Washington County has limited supply of concrete that they're releasing. And if right now sounds like a crazy time to buy, in the next 12 months, things could get a whole lot more complicated. So with that being said, long-term is still pretty unpredictable because it would highly depend on our economy and what this housing market will do to the rest of the US economy and how the rest of the country and the rest of the industries will recover from this. Uh, but also we're seeing some things that are potentially setting up uh, more constraints on the housing market looking further out. But the next 12 months, we for sure think that based on everything that we're seeing, again, don't use this as gospel. The numbers that we're quoting are something that we see in our market based on the MLS figures and also some of the national stats. Uh, but let's dive into some of the local stats and just see what, uh, what we've experienced in March of 2021 right here in Washington County. Let's take a look at the month of March to see how our market performed. So the median sell price is 450,000. It looks like we had a total of 450 new listings hit the market in March and a total of 478 homes go under contract. We had a total of 310 listings, active listings on the market and a total of, of 512 homes were sold in the month of March. And just for comparison's sake, um, it seems like the values and the all available inventory here changes so rapidly that when we put new listings on the market, we don't even look at anything that's like older than two months as a comparable because we still have to um, compare to what the appraisers are doing. But just to give you guys an idea, so looking at the numbers from February of 2021, we had 0.74 months of all available inventory. Our median sale price was just 410. So from February to March, median sale price increased by $40,000. Average days on the market was at around seven. Um, a total number of sold listings was 400, which is 112 fewer than March. So the, the total number of sold listings increased by 112 month over month. Total number of active listings went from 345 in February to just 310 in March. Total number of listings that went under contract in February was at 464 versus 478 in March. And a total number of new listings was 494 in February, but went down to 450 in March. So we're seeing this downward trajectory of all available inventory. We're selling more homes, 
more homes are going under contract and fewer homes are staying and hitting the market. So with that being said, uh, we'd like to talk to you about some of the strategies. So uh, we often, after posting these videos, we get a lot of questions from our clients and our future clients that are thinking about buying or selling in this market. So what should you do? Um, so let's, let's talk about some of the things that have been effective. And I feel like we need to post these videos weekly because every week our market changes so much that you have to come up with a new strategy. So what does it take to get an offer accepted for your average buyer in this market, Michonne? I know you've been working with a lot of buyers and it's been more challenging now than ever. It's definitely been really challenging. So you need to be have a pre-approval pre letter in hand and ready to go. Um, the more money that you're able to offer over asking, the better. Um, this last week, you know, I've offered 20, my clients have offered 20,000 over, 50,000 over, and haven't gotten acceptance. You know, you got to look at it as if you, you're going to be competing with a lot of cash offers. And if you want to stay relevant to a cash offers, cash offers don't weigh on appraisal. So you got to be willing to waive your appraisal condition. Um, offer over asking and pay the difference in cash. So is that something that you're seeing just at the bottom end of the market or is that across all price ranges? That's across all price ranges. And, and I would say anything under 500,000 is it's more challenging. There's a, there's more people that are shopping under 600, under 500,000. You're competing with a lot more people. So the more creative we can get with your offer, um, the better. So on like the affordability scale, if you think about this big pyramid of buyers and their credit worthiness, the availability of cash on hand, there's generally going to be a larger pool of people that are competing for, let's say, all of your listings under half a million. Like that's the most aggressive. And in the past, if we are helping somebody that's purchasing in a million, million plus territory, there's, you know, there's maybe only five people competing instead of 500. And now I swear we see more than 20 people making offers on every listing. Uh, in most cases, by the time the home finally goes under contract, we're seeing 20 to 30 competing offers. And the only reason why it kind of stops at 20 to 30, because as a listing agent, if you are continuing to take offers, you're going to have to provide a formal feedback as a response to each offer. Each offer has to be presented to your client to weigh out pros and cons, and most people they just don't have the time in their day to go over 50 offers. So some of the media stories that you guys are probably seeing out there, how this house in New Jersey received 89 offers. To me, it sounds absolutely absurd. I don't know if the local board of realtors may have some specific requirements that allow for that to happen. But here in this market, we're not normally seeing like 80 or 90 offers. Part of it is sensational clickbait that's generated by the media. But part of it is just not not feasible. It's not rational. Nobody needs that many offers. So as a seller, you typically want one or two great offers and then maybe two or three offers in backup. Like nobody wants to review 89 offers. That's, that's still a bit of a mystery for me. So just to kind of go over things to, to summarize everything we just told you, if you're thinking about competing in our crazy market, you have to have three things. You have to have the financial ability, right? You have to have a pre-approval letter in hand and have a cash reserve. So let's just try this scenario. Let's say that if your loan requires a 10% down payment for the sake of round numbers and you are pre-approved all the way up to 450,000, you want to have your down payment set aside and then you also want to have your cash set aside, that's your cash that you're willing to spend over asking in order to get into a home. And I know this sounds crazy in majority of scenarios because you're not getting a deal, you're overpaying for something. However, following the trends that we discussed earlier in this video, this may not be as bad as what that looks like three months from now. We have so many clients that have been seeing if they should weather the storm, if the housing market is going to crash or if we're going to see a major correction. Personally, I do not see it happening in any foreseeable future. And depending on what the economy does, depending on what all of these programs that are being implemented do, 
I feel that in the next 12 months, the prices will continue to rise before we see any kind of correction or civilization. And as you guys have seen from earlier in this video, the inventory will continue to fall and following the laws of capitalism, it's supply versus demand. So if you have the ability to buy something now, I would not recommend sitting on a fence because your buying ability will continue to decline as the prices continue to increase. So be ready to execute an aggressive offer. If you're buying with cash, a faster close is what makes that cash offer valuable because in the past, we had folks with cash that would make an offer with a 30 day closing. Well, to a potential seller, it, it doesn't mean much because now you've lost a lot of that strength from your cash offer because they could close a financing offer in 30 days. And if the condition on appraisal is waived, is just as good as your cash offer. And then just offer, I'll offer a lease back to the seller. A lease back is often a great thing because some of the sellers that are selling right now are building. Um, and you know, new construction is another interesting topic, which is probably reserved for a whole another video. Uh, we do have a large portfolio of builders that we absolutely love to work with in this crazy market. If you're thinking about getting into new construction, there's a couple of nuances that are associated with that as well. Um, construction financing is a whole other animal and typically it really helps if you have the cash to purchase a lot. Uh, land is not easily attainable right now and everything is top dollar. So in line with rising home prices, cost of land had increased dramatically compared to what we've seen before. Uh, we do have a couple of preferred builders that have been very reasonable with their contracts without too many crazy escalation clause. And I feel like most sellers and builders fall into two category. Those that ride the coattail of the inflation and try to squeeze out every last dollar. And those that feel that they know their margins, they know what the property is worth and they still try to be reasonable. So. There's a couple of things that could potentially still be done in the construction, new construction field. Um, I would say if you're looking at building a new home, uh, you still have two options, right? One of them, you could find a great spec house that just hit the market. And then typically you're back to the scenario with multiple offers, with multiple buyers making uh, offers on that spec house as it hits the MLS. And the other scenario is you could start new construction where you purchase your own lot. And once you have that lot purchased, you can interview a handful of builders and start construction process on that lot. Usually helps if the lot is owned outright, and then you should have a reserve for about additional 10% for, uh, for the down payment to the builder. So once they start doing the draws, and then you could finance the rest of that. So typically I would say for something like that, your new construction budget would be doable if it's closer to about 800,000. Would you say that's about right? To get into a new construction to home? To get into a new construction home. Like if you're building a custom plan and you want, let's say at least a, a quarter or third acre lot. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. We've been having, we've been shopping for client shopping under that and it, we just haven't been able to make it work. So yeah. So let, let's cover a little bit of uh, advice for sellers in this market. So you would think it would be incredible to sell in this market, right? Yeah. Well, if, if you can find somewhere to go. <laughs> well, uh, let's just assume that you have somewhere to go. You know, some of our clients had moved out of state, uh, work took them different places. Some moved out of the country uh, and some started their building process early enough to where right now is a really advantageous time to sell. So when selling, there's a, this is a funny trend and we observe this more so on the buyer side. So as I mentioned earlier in this video, some of our clients have gotten discouraged or got simply got priced out, but they still had to make something happen. And we usually live no, no, no rock unturned for our clients. And we try to look high and low, find off market deals, whatever we could find. And we've seen that work out in a few, few scenarios where, you know, folks kind of go dormant and they're no longer looking and then they find a for sale by owner where somebody that's selling their house on their own because they're trying to save a few bucks by not hiring a realtor or paying any commissions. And then we hear this crazy story where they just purchased a house way below market value and they were able to make it happen. So those are few and far between, but they still happen. But what does that tell us? 
those people that are trying to do for sale by owners often leave more money on the table than they would have netted if they hired a good quality agent that knows what to do with their offers. So, and there's a couple of things that could still go wrong as a seller. We're seeing this crazy buying frenzy and everybody's receiving a ton of offers. But what we're seeing with some of our buyers too is when people get desperate, they make multiple offers on multiple properties, which means that inevitably, you know, they're not planning on buying five homes. And if several offers get accepted because they're finally getting aggressive enough, there's a little bit of a learning curve for every buyer sometimes. And everybody gets apprehensive. We don't like to buy things unless we're getting a deal. Yeah. And a lot of people will start to test their waters. They'll start offering 10 over asking, 20 over asking, 50 over asking, and eventually they hit this magic number where the offer that they're making is attractive enough for the seller. Well, sometimes it happens on more than just one home. I mean, it's crazy to think that they found more than one home they liked with <laughs> as little as the inventory is. However, as a seller, you want to do your best to protect yourself from being one of the many options. And typically, if you have um, a great real estate agent as your listing agent, uh, he or she would be able, he or she would be able to <laughs> filter through some of those offers and create a great scenario A, B, and C, and have a couple more backups. And then uh, it is it is great to have a professional in your corner to make sure that your interests are protected because we're seeing so many offers with escalation clause, we're seeing offers with leasebacks, we're seeing offers with very complex scenarios in a lot of cases that are often hard to wrap your head around to make sure that you're receiving maximum protection as a seller. But as a seller, the ball's in your court, like everything can will work out to your favor, so. But you know, and, and ultimately, yes, like the end result, uh, should be great, but with the average days on the market of being just seven, it doesn't always translate into you selling your property quickly and efficiently because sometimes offers do fail. We've had offers fall apart a day prior to settlement. So mm -hmm. that's something that's very important. And it's, while it's impossible to protect yourself 100% from that, having a professional that's been through those scenarios we usually have the nose for those things and that kind of allows you to prioritize and factor in all of those things. And of course, you as a seller make the final decision. We're just here to present you with facts. So keep that in mind if you're thinking about listing your home anywhere in Washington County or anywhere in Utah or even in other states. The network of our referral partners extends far outside of the state of Utah and we have great agents that we refer our clients to and receive referrals from in all 50 states. So if you're thinking about selling your home somewhere else, because a lot of the things that we talked about in this video apply across all markets. We're starting to see this frenzy more so in some states than others. Uh, it seems like there are certainly more, uh, some, some parts of the country that are more desirable that are people moving to, and there are some parts where people are moving from. However, affordable mortgages and low inventory is creating this scenario to a certain degree in pretty much all markets across the nation. Folks, if you found this video useful, please share it with your friends. Give it a thumbs up so that YouTube can implement its algorithm and share this video with more people. If you have any more questions or we left anything unanswered, leave us a comment below this video and make sure to get back to every single one of them. And if you haven't already, make sure you hit that subscribe button. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button. And if you want to give this crazy market a shot, please be sure to reach out to us and we'll be happy to help you with your buying, selling, or investing needs right here in Southern Utah. We have many, many more videos coming. It's been super hectic here and we haven't been uploading our regular schedule, but I promise we will do better. Until then, we'll see you in the next one. Peace.